Good afternoon. It's Friday afternoon, and we have some sun in Seattle, so I'm very excited about that. It's been a dreary couple of weeks. We're going to just wait for some people to join us today. We're talking about heat and ice. I'm Dr. Heather Denniston. I am a chiropractor and a newly certified personal trainer. Kind of excited about that. And I also write the blog, Well Fit and Fed. So if you are not a part of that blog yet, please come over to our tribe. Just click the link that I will post below and you can sign up directly and you will get very informative articles, recipes, and workouts into your inbox. And during our broadcast today, I wanna to make sure that you click hearts and thumbs up to let me know when you're listening and if there's something particular you're enjoying, because again, it helps me create content for future broadcasts. I see we have a couple people joining us. I'm just gonna wait a little bit longer. Our three-day reset online program is going fantastically. We are getting ready to start week three, and I am in the background also preparing to run another one in a couple of months, and so that is very exciting. And if you at all are interested in being part of our three-day reset tribe where we can transform your eating in a completely doable way, please uh, message me or leave me a note below. I will also leave a link to some information on that. Okay, I can see just a couple more people joining in. How's everybody doing? Please say hello if you're here. Hello, hello, people. Okay, we're going to get started. I don't know why this is a favorite subject of mine, but it is, and that is the subject of when to heat and when to ice. <clears throat> I found over 20 years of practice that patients were very confused by this, and when I gave them a basic uh, directions and um, instructions on it, they really were grateful and, and understood better how to apply heat or ice you know, in injuries, arthritis, all different aspects of when you might think about temperature therapy. So the background is that temperature therapy has been used forever. You can think back in the history books to the Roman baths, to saunas in Denmark, to ice baths, to all sorts of different ways that we used heat and ice therapy throughout the ages, and we still do because it's extremely effective. And so we are going to talk about what cold therapy is and what heat therapy is and the different types and why you want to use one versus the other and it's very important because if you get it wrong you could get yourself into trouble we don't want that so the question of which to use well let's say you are a skier and you have a bad fall during your ski day and you get back to the condo and you think you know what I'm gonna treat this with a hot tub and some Bloody Marys and you think that's a really good idea and so then the next morning, your roommates have to transport you to emergency because you can't get out of bed. We're going to come back to that story because it's very particular what you choose to do in certain situations and it can have negative outcomes, again, if you choose the wrong one. So let's start with cold therapy. Cold therapy is pretty basic. It's you're applying cold to an area that's painful to help alleviate pain in that area. And there's different ways of using cold therapy. So you could use an ice pack. You could use direct ice massage. You could get in an ice bath, okay? So there's obviously different ways to do that. The most common is the ice pack, and that's what we're gonna talk about, although we will cover a little bit about direct ice. Ice is, I want you to listen to this because we are going to keep coming back to this in relationship to ice versus heat. So ice is a sedative, a muscle relaxant, and a vasoconstrictor. A sedative, a muscle relaxant, and a vasoconstrictor. So keep that in mind as we go through our discussion today. So when we apply it, it actually really helps with inflammation as well. So when you apply ice for 20 to 30 minutes, because it vasoconstricts, it pushes fluid away from the area, which decreases inflammation, which is good. We want to ice for a period of 20 to 30 minutes. Let's talk about that. Ice goes through several stages when you apply it to your body. And let's keep in mind, when you take an ice pack out of the freezer, you want to just put a paper towel between it and your body. Not a big dish towel, not a thick bath towel, because it's not going to do what it needs to do. 
the ice needs to go through, or the application of ice needs to go through several phases. And so first it's going to feel cold, obviously. Then it's going to feel a bit burny. Then it's going to be painful. And that's when a lot of people go, I can't do this. I can't do icing. And it's usually right between minute four and seven that that real achy pain, like, oh, can't get through it kind of part comes. But know that as soon as you get through that, it's going to be numb and you're going to be in bliss because not only are you not going to feel the ice anymore, you're not going to feel a lot of the pain of your problem anymore. So know that icing goes through a consecutive of uh, cold, burn, pain, and then numb. We want to get to that numb phase. And the problem with wrapping too much cover around an ice pack is we don't ever get it to that numb phase where it can be highly anti-inflammatory. So if you are wrapping it too much or you're keeping your ice packs in your fridge, which I know some of you do, uh, yay, thumbs up, hey, then know that you're not getting the full benefit of icing. We want it to get to that numb phase. When you take an ice pack off and tap the tissue, it should be numb. Okay, that's where the benefit happens. So back to the timing, 20 to 30 minutes. After 20 to 30 minutes, you wanna remove the ice and listen closely. That tissue has to come all the way back up to room temperature before you can apply ice again. I'm gonna say it again. When you take an ice pack off, the tissue has to come all the way back up to room temperature before you apply ice again. Why? because if you don't let it come back to room temperature, you run the risk of frostbite in your tissues. So in practice, there were occasions, and I hate to say how many, because it was often, where patients would be lying on the table, they'd come in and I'd pop their shirt up and I'd say, oh, Jim, you been icing? And he'd say, oh yeah, yeah, tons, tons and tons. <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, well, you frostbitten yourself because a brown mottled appearance on their back would show up because he's literally burned the tissue. So if you don't remove the ice after 30 minutes, uh, you run the risk of frostbite. And also if you don't let that tissue rewarm to room temperature, and then you can reapply the ice, but if you don't let it rewarm, you're running a risk. So that's the biggest risk with ice, is frostbiting, okay? So be cautious with that. You have to have one barrier between you and the ice pack, but make it thin, and keep it to 20 to 30 minutes. Now that's for ice packs. And this is what I mean by an ice pack. These guys, I pulled this out of my freezer, I have about 50 of them in there. And I'm gonna put a link to these because they are the best, these blue gel ice packs, love them. Use them in my practice a ton. And they have silica gel inside which stays very cold. So things like frozen peas, um, you know, old vegetables, whatever, in the freezer, don't stay cold enough, long enough to get you to that numb phase and get the full benefit of icing. And sometimes direct ice cubes in a bag are is too cold. So get the proper gel ice pack, it molds to your tissues really well, and it stays cold enough, long enough, and it's safer. So I'll put that link down below. Now, if we do direct icing, many of you will remember from soccer, or softball, or whatever, they pull the little Dixie cups out of the freezer and they tear off the top and they might massage a sprained shoulder or sprained ankle with direct ice. And direct ice can be very, very effective, but it does run a higher risk because you're putting that very, very cold right onto the tissue. So it's only 10 minutes for direct ice. And that includes if you're gonna, one of the best ways to deal with an ankle sprain is dunk it in a bucket of ice and water and stick it in there and you can do one minute on, one minute off, one minute on, one minute off, but don't go over 10 minutes. Because again, that 10 minute rule for direct ice is the same as that 20 to 30 minute rule for ice packs. So we do not wanna run the risk of frostbite. So direct ice, you can freeze an ice cup or use an ice cube and you can put it directly on whatever area is sore. I used it a lot in my practice with jaw, direct on ankle sprains, there's, it's limitless. And then the ice pack, of course, you can use directly over anything as well. Ice packs are 20 to 30 minutes, ice cup or direct ice or ice bath, 10 minutes, okay? Okay, and cyclical icing, where you do 30 on, 30 off, 30 on, 30 off, 30 on, 30 off, can be extremely effective. So make sure that when you are doing some icing for a particular injury that you consider just continually repeating it three or four times in a day and you may get better results from that. Okay, 
Yes. Okay, so we're moving on to, we talked about making sure you keep your ice pack in your freezer. That's important. Don't keep it in your fridge. Let's move on to, to heat because that is also very therapeutic and who wouldn't rather use heat than ice? I know it's tempting, okay, but there are some issues with heat and we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about first what types of heat you can use. So you can use those little microwavable things or you can use a heating pad or you can use a hot water bottle or you can use damp heat. In our practice, we had a hot water tank full of hot water, and in it was a pack. They're called hydrocolator packs, and they're kept at 160 degrees, and we take them out, and we wrap them in a terry cloth towel, and we apply that to the patient. And why do we go to all that trouble? It's because damp heat gets deeper than dry heat, significantly. And so why not get the benefit of that at home by, wait for it, wrapping a damp towel around a hot water bottle. So one of my favorite ways to heat at home is wrap a damp towel around a hot water bottle. Do not wrap it around a heating pad because a heating pad is electrical and you could get electrocuted, so please don't do that. Damp towel around a hot water bottle is perfect. The microwavable things are nice as well and um, so there's lots of options, but what are the regulations with heat? Where can we go wrong? Let's go back to our skier from the beginning. So Mr. Skier fell, hurt himself, and what he didn't realize is he hurt himself worse than he thought. And so then he goes and jumps in a hot tub for 30 minutes and he vasodilates all the tissue. Do you remember what I said about ice? It's a vasoconstrictor. Heat, when applied, is a vasodilator, so it opens up those tissues and all the inflammation comes flooding through at a pace that is probably well in advance of what it should be. And then he has three Bloody Marys, which is also a vasodilator. What happens when we drink al alcohol? We flush. And that further exacerbated the problem. So guess who ended up in the hospital the next day? Mr. Skier, because he double-sized, supersized his inflammatory response because of poor choices. He chose heat, he should have chosen ice. So we need to be aware of that. When is there inflammation there? When do we want to be applying heat versus ice? Okay, let's go back to ice is a sedative, a muscle relaxant, and a vasoconstrictor. Heat is a sedative, a muscle relaxant, and a vasodilator. I'm going to say this a couple times. If you are unsure what to do, you really don't know, this one is always the safest because pushing inflammation away is less dangerous than pulling it into an injury. So err on the side of caution, stick with ice. But let's talk about heat because it can be extraordinarily useful for people with arthritis, really old injuries, those sorts of things, loosening up the muscles, loosening up the range of motion in the joints. Heat's fantastic for that. Remember, we've also got sauna. We've got a warm bath or shower as well. And those are extremely effective systemic ways of heating the body to produce therapeutic benefit. Okay. Oh, word on inflammation. So we talked about how when we get an injury, we get inflammation. Now, inflammation is not bad in itself. Inflammation is your body sending fluids to an area to puff it up to protect it and to provide nutrients that will heal the wound or the injury. So it's a good thing. So I had a mentor who was adamant about not icing anything because he said, your body has a natural response, let it do its thing, let it heal, and it should respond in the way it's supposed to. Don't shut off that inflammatory response. Here's my problem with that. I can, with all honesty, say that 90% of the patients coming into my office were pro-inflammatory. And what that means is that they had a heightened inflammatory situation going on in their body because of the following. Stress, lack of sleep, poor diet, dehydration, exposure to chemicals. 
And if you're starting out in a pro-inflammatory stage and you get an injury, instead of like the inflammatory particles, you know, taking their time, getting to the injury and just a few of them going and surrounding the wound and healing it, it's like junior high kids running out of school at the end of the term like crazy you're going to get this massive inflammatory response because your body's already heightened in regard to inflammation so i feel like ice is actually a very good choice because many of us most of us have too much inflammation going on anyway you uh, add an injury in there and then it's all crazy so we want to make sure that we apply ice when necessary okay uh, we were talking about heat so we're going to get back to that there is heat ice contrast and i want to touch on that for a minute because that's such an amazing way to rehabilitate an injury so you can apply heat for five to ten minutes then ice for five to ten minutes heat for five to ten minutes ice for five to ten minutes my recommendation for you is that we always end on ice i would prefer that you vasoconstrict at the end of that treatment as opposed to vasodilate so Heat, there, heat ice contrast is a really good choice if you have a newly or a, a week or two old sprain or a strain. It because what it does is it creates a pump, so it opens and then pushes out and then brings in inflammatory particles that are good and then pushes them out and then brings it in and then pushes it out and so it's very good. It creates kind of this gateway of flushing stuff out of the injury, but if the injury is too acute or there's too much inflammation in there, we want to stick with the ice. Okay, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. You should see my notes. <laughs> oh, I am one person giving you advice, and it's from a lot of experience, but I will tell you that if you went into your acupuncturist and said, Dr. Heather told me I should ice more than heat, they would throw their hands up because different practices have different philosophies on ice and heat. Your acupuncturist is going to tell you to heat every single time. 10 out of 10. Your medical doctor after an injury is going to say ice has no benefit after 48 hours or 72 if they're super forward thinking. I disagree. Again, back to that pro-inflammatory thing I talked about before. We're walking soup bowls of inflammation and our bodies tend to over respond. So I actually find ice is extremely effective at all sorts of times during an injury. And guess what? It can't hurt if you use it effectively. So there's no bad side and there could be a very good side. So do not hesitate to throw an ice pack on something when in question. So let's just go through a couple scenarios, if you will. So you have a brand new ankle sprain. What do you do? Feel free to comment below. Well, we're gonna ice because a brand new ankle sprain is highly inflammatory. What if your ankle sprain is four weeks old? Well, if you've healed well, an ice heat contrast would be awesome. You also might want to do ice part of the time, heat part of the time. If you're really nicely far along, you can stick with just heat to loosen up that joint and you know bring some good nutrients into the musculature. What if you have arthritis? Well, arthritis tends to not like cold and it's for good reason. It doesn't respond well to it from a physiology standpoint. So heat is better with arthritis in most cases. Now, I had tons of patients come into my clinic and elderly patients and say, I have had low back pain for months. And when we dig a little deeper into the subjective, we find out they've been using a heating pad every night, all night. Now, what did we say about heat? use it for 20 or 30 minutes, and it's a vasodilator. So guess what they've been doing? They've been creating inflammation in their low back. So although it feels better while it's on, it's creating a problem the next morning. And so things like using a heating pad for too long period of time and those sorts of things, that's another contraindication for using heat. Okay. Oh, I ran a marathon today. No, I didn't. But let's say you did, what are you gonna do? Well, many are going to jump into an Epsom salt bath, which is completely appropriate if you're in good shape and you had a good race and you don't think you have any injuries. If you have injuries, you might do a short Epsom salt bath and then ice the really sore spots after because remember we said with contrast therapy, we're going to end with ice, okay? 
For menstrual cramps, what do we do? Everyone leans toward heat. Wrong. What is menstruation? Sorry, guys that are out there. It's inflammation, right? It's a massive inflammation and then a flushing. Well, guess what's going to help that? Ice is going to be better for premenstrual cramps, okay? And I think that's it. Okay, so we're going to do just a quick recap. Ice is a sedative, muscle relaxant, vasoconstrictor. Heat is a sedative, muscle relaxant, vasodilator. Ice, 20 to 30 minutes. Unless you're doing direct ice, 10 minutes. Heat, 20 to 30 minutes. Take breaks, don't use it all night. Be careful how hot the temperature is. And if you can at all manage it, use damp heat with a dish towel wrapped around the hot water bottle, not the heating pad, and apply that for 20 minutes. If it's getting too hot, if it's uncomfortable, take it off. You can burn yourself with heat just as much as you can frostbite yourself with ice. So use your discretion. But hopefully that helps you guys with some icing and heating conundrums. And I am here to answer any questions. So if you have questions, please list them below. And I look forward to responding. And again, check out wellfitandfed.com. Please head on over there and sign up. I've got lots of great things coming in the next quarter that are gonna all be freebies for my members. And so come on over and get signed up, okay? Have a great Friday, have a great weekend. It's great to see you guys. And I look forward to seeing you next Friday. And I will reveal what we're talking about midweek. All right, have a good weekend.